Is this your segue to the discussion of trip of why there's some why are there so many AAA superhero movies? Yeah, let's let's move to that now. This is a kind of natural <laughs> transition. So, um, so when I so I mentioned in the past, I was I read comic books when I was a teenager, and um, you're a comic book fan as well. And you know, kind of in the like, so the, you know, Superman came out in the '70s and '80s, and Batman came out in the '80s and '90s, and those are really the only superhero movies that came out um, for a really long time. And as a kid, I was a, I was a Marvel fan. So, but for people who don't know, DC and Marvel, the two main comic companies, DC is kind of the mostly the older characters: Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern. Uh, these are the classic DC characters, and Marvel is the characters that were created. Uh, except for Captain America, really, all in the early 60s by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Spider-Man, X-Men, Avengers, Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, Incredible Hulk, these are all Marvel characters. So uh, kind of when you're reading, when you're getting into comics as a kid, a lot of people are either Marvel people or DC people. I was, and kind of the difference, at least how it used to be, was that Marvel was a little more realistic than DC was, and the Marvel characters were more conflicted and more human than the DC characters. I don't know, but I don't, I don't know if I don't know about more. I think more realistic is a mistake. I think they're, they 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 were grittier, mm-hmm. um, and there was an attempt for a greater um, realism in maybe some of the sort of characterizations and stuff. But right. the Marvel universe is much more far out than the DC universe. Okay, that's in interesting. Of, so yeah, so the yeah. the classic Marvel character is um, is uh, Spider Man. And we contrast that with the classic, the two classic DC characters of Superman and Batman. And Spider-Man seems like a much more human character. Yes, than, yes. Than, uh, Superman obviously isn't a human. Of course, he came yes. from uh, the planet Krypton. And But Batman, Batman is human. And Batman is an interesting character because he has no actual um, superpowers. He's just a human, you know, at the peak performance and really, really smart and a really good fighter and inventor and stuff. But, um, you know, these characters are... You know, they were superheroes in kind of the most literal respect, whereas the Marvel heroes were often, you know, Peter Parker was a teenager. He went to high school. He had problems. This was the original creation of Stan Lee. And, you know, he, right. he, he was a nerd. He got beat up. Obviously, uh, a lot of comic book readers are nerds as well and possibly get beat up. So they had, I did, right. it's easier to identify in certain ways with the Marvel characters than the DC characters. So anyway, there, so basically for a number of years, there were no Marvel movies. There were a couple kind of weird ones like uh, Blade. I don't know if you ever saw those in the... Sure. In the 90s. Sure. But those weren't, those were third tier characters and the movies were never very good. And then around 99 or 2000, um, the X Men movie came out. And that was like a huge deal if you were a comic book fan because there had never been a Marvel movie like that of marquee characters with um, name actors uh, yeah. in it. And they did yeah. a pretty good job with that first X Men movie. And since then, like, comic book movies have taken over the cinema. And basically, every time you read a review of a comic book movie in the Times, Half of it is complaining about how many comic book movies there are these days, and you know the blockbusters every year are almost all comic book movies. So it really is like the geeks have have conquered. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. what, what do you think about this? Okay, so just quickly, just on the timeline. I mean, I, I think about this maybe a little bit differently, uh, partly because I'm older. Um, um, as a kid, um, there were some pretty—I don't want to call them influential, but culturally ubiquitous um comic book presences but they were all on the small screen okay so you're so so, you were a kid in the 70s i was a kid in the 70s i was in high school in the 80s and so i grew up watching um uh the original justice league cartoon um which was for kids right um um which was dc obviously Mm -hmm. um i watched the incredible hulk the lou ferrigno right bill bixby incredible hulk right um I grew up watching Wonder Woman on TV um, uh, with what's her name, Linda. Um, oh God, I can't remember the name of the actress. I know who you're um, talking about, right? Um, uh, and also uh, another thing that I watched, but this is actually from before my time, but it was heavily in syndication. Was the was the original Batman TV show right? And and there was which, a Superman which was TV fan, show, which also. was fantastic, and the Superman George Reeves. Yeah, George Reeves. And so I don't want to I don't want to go too far in saying that sort of you know comic books didn't get out into the mass media culture right. um, uh, because I don't think that's true I think that actually it had quite a quite a potent presence on kids yeah so I, um, so these all these thing all these you're right and most of these things were DC I think um, DC for some re- Marvel for some reason maybe had more rights issues or something most of the stuff that came out before 
around the year 2000. It was DC. A, a, a movie or a TV show for whatever reason was DC. That's right. And, that's um, right. But a lot of these also were really crappy and really campy also. Well, but but let's 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 distinguish crappy from cra- – crappy <laughs> from ca- – I can't speak. Right. Let's distinguish crappy from campy mm-hmm. because – I'm actually going to come back to this when we talk about romanticism versus grittiness because I actually think that the camp has always been a part of comic books mm-hmm. and I think it actually is a mistake to get rid of it. Um, um, yeah. But yeah, some of them were crappy, but I would not say the original Batman was not crappy. It was campy. Okay. But it was actually amazingly, amazingly made and they and the, the episodes really stand up. They're hilarious. Uh, they're also beautiful looking. Oh, really? So I, um, I haven't watched any of those since I was a kid. So that, yeah, I, I, yeah. It's inter- it'd be interesting to go back and see them. Okay. So I think, yeah, campy and crappy, that's a good, a good yeah, distinction. So I sure. want to distinguish those two. So, okay. So comic books had a presence in the mass media, but it was on the small screen and it was, you know, almost entirely really towards kids. And mm-hmm. I mean, kids like prepubescent kids. Right. Um, um, uh, by the time I was in high school, I wasn't reading comics anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I came back to them as an adult. Um, but then um, to me, the really big event, um, it wasn't the first Superman movie, although that was huge. And that came out, you know, it, it had a real cast um, it was with a real director. It was Richard Donner. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a very good movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but it almost was, it felt to me like superhero had crossed into the mainstream of movie making rather than a superhero movie. To me, the first movie that really felt like, wow, um, was the was the Tim Burton Batman, the first Tim Burton Batman. Mm-hmm. That was the first one that really felt like, okay, we're taking comics really seriously and making a a, a big scale film, um, almost like we like big scale films that people like James Cameron and Ridley Scott were making. Right, right. right. So when did, that, when did was, that first Batman movie come out? Was it like eighty eight like, or eighty nine? It was either at the very end of the eighties. It was the the first year of the night, but I, I want to say it was eighty eight or yeah. I want to say it was eighty eight. I think it's earlier than ninety. So yeah, so I was yeah, I was yeah. too young to see that. I mean, yeah. so it was dark. The other thing is that the 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 Bat- Batman Tim right. movies were dark and aimed right. explicitly at adults in the way that right. everything previous in yes, and, and it did been. not ex- it did not explicitly evoke the Frank Miller Dark Knight because one of the things we have to sort of when we talk about Batman is remember that. Batman in the comics had a substantial reboot, right? Um, with the with the really, in my opinion, important uh, Frank Miller original Frank Miller Dark Knight Batman, which was also one of the first graphic novels mm-hmm. that comic superhero graphic novels. Of course, it wasn't. I mean, there's stuff going back to Will Eisner all the way back to way earlier than that. Mm-hmm. But um, um, so, um, so superhero, right? Uh, 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 but but the the Tim Burton movie did not explicitly evoke the Dark Knight version of Batman, but it was the Dark Knight version of Batman, um, with Burton's weird quirk uh, quirkiness yeah. to it. Um, so let's let's uh, talk a little bit more about Batman. So Batman is one of the earliest comic book characters after Superman, um, and everyone of course knows the the story, but it's you know a classic story. But the character itself is very dark. You know, obviously his parents are murdered in front of him as a child, and you know some people think that Batman is basically a psychopath. But the the series from the Adam West series made this character kind of really campy and a joke, right? And right. Um, so the so what Frank Miller did, who was a uh, both a writer and and the artist of this this series, um, he it takes place in the future, but it was kind of a um, a getting back to the original dark vision of the character and doing it in a very serious way. Uh, yeah. that, that would that was much darker would appeal more to adults than kids and really erase the campy aspect that that Adam West had yeah. you know given the character for like 20 years and very political it was all tied into right. a critique of, 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 of was tied into reaganism right so is it if, if I, I haven't read it in a number of years but as i recall reagan is still president yes in a, a little bit like in Watchmen, Nixon is still president. Right, right. That's right? An, I never even thought about that before, but that's an interesting. Yeah, so we'll yeah. talk about Watchmen a little bit too. Yeah. But in that, in yeah. that series, Nix, it takes place in the 80s, uh, the late 80s, but Nixon is still president um, in that series that's right. as well. That, that, that's right. Um, and so um, so to me, the, the, the Tim Burton Batman was the first really – it was the first in the mold of the blockbuster superhero movies we now are awash in. Mm-hmm. The, the the Burton Batman was the first one of that of this type, and then all the others come after. And I agree that the significance of X Men as being the first Marvel foray, foray into this territory, mm-hmm. 
but I think the franchise was not was was not particularly good and and, and was relatively weak despite some amazing cast. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not sure why that is. Um, uh, you know, if you and I had six hours, we could sort of pull this apart. Um, um, but I, we don't, we don't want to do that. So yeah, we um, want to, we don't want to bore our viewers more than right. we already have, but, um, I would say, yeah, that you, you make some interesting points. And I think Batman set the tone for a number of these comic movies, which is one of the real critiques that people who never read comics and are sick of these movies talk about constantly, which is like, they're too self-serious. Isn't this just a comic book? Why can't this right. just be fun? Why is this? Why are the heroes always always tormented? Why is it? Ta- why is it always have these weird political undertones? Why does it take itself so seriously? Can't this just be a fun popcorn movie? And I think that that's a critique that a lot of uh, applies to a lot of comic book movies that have come out in the past decade. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy is kind of an exception that was really more a throwback towards Star Wars and just a fun yeah, adventure a movie, romp. adventure a movie. romp. Yeah, and yeah. That, I really like that one a lot. So hopefully more. And that one, I think, has been more successful than most of the other recent comic movies. So hopefully they'll kind of see that, you know, that in comics, you know, there, there's, there's, you can do it in a way that isn't so overwrought and self-serious. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now, in terms of the why, now, the last thing was sort of the why, the explosion of blockbuster movies now. Um, I mean, I have my own my own theory on this, and I think it is it really does represent the triumph of geek culture. Mm-hmm. Um, that that in a sense, uh, and I have a theory as to why we've had a tri- why there's been a triumph of geek culture. Um, uh, you know, I, I remember when being a geek was was bad for your health. <laughs> I mean, you know, back in the eighties. The geeks got shoved into lockers and, you know, had their faces ground into the mud and, and you know, they, right. they, they were picked on and bullied and harassed. Right. And this was in the days before, you know, all this anti-bullying stuff. And so you people just got away with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that what's happened is that the triumph of technology, the ubiquity of technology in our lives mm-hmm. has, in a sense, almost uh, vindicated or justified the geek vision. Um, I think of this almost impressionistically. Um, if you had been walking, if 1984, if you'd been walking around, bent over a little device, you know, tapping things with your fingers, <laughs> you would have gotten beaten up. <laughs> you would have been right? looking at a graphing calculator or something like you'd that. Be, or you'd be like playing like, like a Mattel electronic football game or like or <laughs> something like that. Um, now that's not only you, that's cool. Yeah. It's cool to walk into walk around with devices. You see people who, if you, if you thought of the, their counterparts of their social stress, they're taught top click kids in high school Mm -hmm. in 1984, wouldn't be caught dead walking around with some device and wires coming out of his. And now everybody is. And so I think that I think that I think that the cell phone culture, the constant you know walking around essentially with a portable computer, yeah, I think that in a sense vindicated um, um, sort of the geek culture. Mm-hmm. Also, I would also argue that the the enormous popularity and mainstreaming of gaming mm-hmm. has also vindicated geek culture. Right, and so you bring all this sort of together, and that explains now why the stuff that the geeks like is now mainstream and now really popular. Right. Um, so uh, that, I think that's a great that's, <laughs> that's a great explanation. It kind of reminded me. Have you seen? Uh, did you see the Twenty One Jump Street movie? No, I watched the original show when it ran. Okay, that was. I, I, I was a little. I'm, bring, I'm a little too young for to actually have seen the original show. I couldn't bring myself to watch oh, okay, it. Okay, you it, should. You know, it's the, it's <laughs> done in a very smart way. And so the so you know it's the same basic premise: uh, cops going undercover at a high school. But the joke is that. Um, you know, it's Channing Tatum and Jonah Hill, and Channing Tatum is, you know, this big uh, guy, like a classic kind of jock type, and he thinks that to blend in, he's going to have to basically be a bully and make fun of people, but uh, when he comes to realize, and there's actually, I think Matt Lewis and Bill Sher talked about this one time, because Matt saw the movie and kind of was struck by the same thing I was, which is that uh, there's, a, there's a, actually a cultural kind of cultural analysis and critique in this silly movie, which is that uh, the Channing Tatum character quickly realizes that kids these days uh, think it's cool to care about things. Um, right. and when he was in high school, even though Channing Tatum is not that much older than, uh, you know, he's probably in his late twenties or early thirties, you know, the cool kids, they didn't care about anything, you know, they just wanted to party or whatever, but there's been a cultural shift and caring about things, uh, has become cool. So caring about social issues is kind of what well, they talk about least, in some or, ways, but also at least pretending to, at least pretending to care about them. Right. But being, um, being, I'm not sure, sure how sincere I think all of this is. Actually. Okay. But I think, um, <laughs> you know, being, it used to be that if you were obsessed with something, 
you know, you were in your basement or something, <laughs> you know, right, reading right. It, pouring over it. Now you can be obsessed about something and find a whole community of people online who are also obsessed That's with true. it, who are sprinkled around the world, and you can find a community that way. So being so, the kind of the things that used to set the geek apart, like tech, technology, as you pointed out, everyone has a cell phone and everyone is computer literate these days. But also being really, really into something is kind of the definition of being a geek. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now, and so being really, really into something used to be used to mark you as weird. But now, if you're really, really into something, you can find ten thousand other people who are really, really into it too. That's right. And you can make a community That's with right. them. That's right. That's right. And and you know the most the most fully developed, fleshed out version of that then is the sort of the hipster culture, mm -hmm. um, especially the, 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 the 20 something, maybe into the early thirties hipster culture. I mean, basically these people are the only reason that there are great independent restaurants in major cities. <laughs> um, no, watch, watch vice. Vice has got a show called munchies mm -hmm. in which they run a show called chef night out, which is one of my favorite shows on, on the internet now. Mm -hmm. And basically it goes to a different restaurant every time in a different city most of them though seem to be in williamsburg brooklyn mm -hmm. um and inevitably it's a hipster chef that's interesting and they are so into it in a way you're right in the sense that you know it wasn't cool to be obsessive and into things back 20 30 years ago mm -hmm. more 30 years ago and now it is and um so i i, I think that that's that, that that's right um right. Uh, we've become a kind of an enthusiast culture mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, that is, that has its origins in, in geeks and, and model plane builders and, and, and all the other stuff that used to be niche. <laughs> right. Ham radio, the, the ham radio niche, people yeah. are kind of, kind of like yeah. the proto internet, yeah. but actually there's yeah. kind of a contradiction here that I'm sensing. So I think everything we've said so far makes sense, but then at the same time, we have to put it up against, um, uh, a lot of popular culture, uh, is becoming more and more homogenized and there's kind of a, I don't know if it's actually a paradox, but it's seemingly paradoxical that. You know, all the movies look the same at the same time that everyone can find their own little niche to fit into and get their pop culture this way. So I don't know if it's yeah. because um, all the hipsters hipsters don't go to movies anymore because they're all, you know, like pursuing scrimshaw or something like that. So that only the, you know, kind of the masses go to the movies yeah. anymore. So Hollywood serves up, you know, pablum for the masses or if it's that only they only do things. I mean, obviously, a movie has to have wide appeal to be uh successful especially a movie that costs hundreds of million dollars to make and market which all these giant cj movies have to so there's kind of a homogenization effect you know that's, that's inherent in that in yeah. that system and a lot of you know the critique of the of the superhero movies and the transformers movies and ninja turtles and all these things is that they're all they all seem the same you don't know they're all confusing and they all look the same and um that that's kind of happened at the same time that this you know, specialization that the internet has brought about has, has happened. So do, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I actually don't think it's contradictory. I think that what happens is that as niche cult, as you get more and more niche culture, because uh, just the medium itself permits, right? You know, before you had cable, you could only have how many channels, you know, right. you had four channels, then you have cable. Now you have hundreds. Well, now you have the internet, you got thousands or millions, mm -hmm. right. Of channels. So, you know, you add up all that many niches, and that's the majority now, right? Right. And, 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 and the pop culture is just the most crass commercial kind of shit you can possibly imagine. Right. So it used, to, think, it used to be the critique of pop culture was that it was, you know, lowbrow. But, you know, there's a lot of great stuff that was produced, you know. Just look right. at look the that's sitcom right. Cheers. You know, there's a great – you can watch that's that right. today. It's hilarious. Right. It's great. That's but right. still a lot of great stuff happened. But now, right. you know, the people who, who made Cheers today – are now making, you know, this, their, their equivalents today are making a show for, like, the FX channel that That's right. gets, you know, 5% right. of the viewers, and they're able to go a lot darker and more hilarious. That's right. Uh, but fewer people are watching it, and it's less, you know, the, the you know your grandma is not watching FX, whereas your grandma might have watched Cheers back in the day. That's right. That's right. And, and I think it's the most visible, the most evident in popular music, um, you know. You know, the last time you had mega star popular music, which was actually good music was the eighties, right? Where you still had real bands that uh -huh. actually wrote the music, played the instruments, were good at it. You know, Duran Duran, you can make jokes. They were a good band. They could, they I'll could take your play instruments. No, I mean they could play instruments. Okay. They could, they could sing, right? They could write catchy melodies. Mm -hmm. The Police were a good band, right? Mm -hmm. The Spice Girls are not a band at all. Right, they're a Kesha, fake assembly. Kesha, Kesha is not a band at all, right? And what the, Somebody the, else writes the music for her. Right. She just performs it. It's not even her voice. It's auto-tune. And so what I think has happened is 
the actual popular culture, if you, what you mean is the mass national culture, has become almost completely emptied out. There's a handful of sort of plastic dolls walking around in it. <laughs> and the rest of it is being made by niche culture. Mm -hmm. But since there's so much of it spread across so many niches, that now has become sort of the popular culture. Right. Um, um, it's just very heterogeneous. Um, um, but the but but what we used to call pop music, it doesn't exist anymore. Right, and it, I think it, that it, if you th that really makes sense when you turn when turn when you think about rock music in particular. I mean, there aren't rock stars anymore in the way there used to be. I mean, that's who, right. Who, and the and the the greatest you know the the musicians that make the most money touring are the people who are the top you know rock stars in the seventies and eighties. You know, like right. you, they're you ninety two years and, old, you right, right. right. You know, right. they're and the, the and Rolling the Stones, Stones. Right. they're still right. going. But right. but no group you can never ima imagine you know uh, Rolling Stones happening again just because the the you know it, like Kanye West is like the equivalent of the Rolling Stones today or Jay Z and Beyonce right but, except that they're not as good right, right. well I don't know whether or not they're as good but they're definitely not as popular and it's not like every every kid is is listening they won't to have it. the the point is when I say they're not as good they don't have the staying power look. The Rolling Stones in 50 years, 100 years, people will still be playing. But you're still going to be hearing "Give Me Shelter." Right. I doubt in 50 years anybody will remember who the hell Kanye West was. <laughs> um, well, because, I, I don't know. Well, that's, I, I won't. It's, I won't it's offer... not because of inherent. It's not because of inherent quality. It's because of everything surrounding it has to do with the fact that we no longer listen to the radio. It has to do with you know. It has to do with the way that we get this stuff. It doesn't. It doesn't have the opportunity to become in, 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 in established in the consciousness right. in the way that it used to. Right. Like Kanye West doesn't define a whole generation the way that the way that, that the Rolling Stones did or that because he couldn't. Yeah, right? yeah. So there okay, there, so I agree that there obviously couldn't be um another Rolling Stones or another Beatles or even anything like U two or, or um Springsteen again. Um That's right. but I mean the thing is that the, the 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 landscape is just so much more diverse now so that if I you know it's like where are the, where are the people who would be the next Rolling Stones you know maybe they are um because they can't get a, a million dollar contract or they're on or, indie or, labels or any contract at all right they're indie labels and maybe they're working as right. bartenders in Brooklyn right. but you know they could be doing things that are, are as good as as the Rolling Stones and releasing their stuff free online and it attracts its own small audience and then the things that um, the gatekeepers um, would have prevented from coming out and never would have gotten a recording contract in the you know 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. They can just release it themselves. That's and right. there's things like uh, mashup artists, um, like uh, Girl Talk. Do you know about Girl Talk? Sure, sure. Okay, I love Girl Talk, uh, I, but I don't really like. His, the, the, <laughs> I sound like a hipster. I don't like the new stuff. But yeah, has this new album that I I listened to a little bit and didn't make any sense to me. But his old stuff is, you know, he mash up. He takes uh, the beat from one song and the lyrics from another song, combines them together, and he releases all for free because he's violating copyright and he can never um, get, uh, you, you know, he can never sell it because he'd be sued by all the artists. But since I think the artists kind of semi respect what he's doing and he just releases it for free, download online. He can't be sued, and then he performs it. I actually got to go to a show that he did once, and it was really, really great. He does he does the mixing live on stage, so it's different every time. Yeah. And uh, it was it was a really great show. So if, I'm sure he's probably touring again. If you ever have a chance to see him, I definitely recommend it. But, you know that kind of thing um, can bubble up because of the internet, and right. uh, and it never it never could before. But at the same time, right. there will never be another even like another U2, you know. Right. It can't bubble up to the degree that it has this culture and generation defining. Um, um, quality because of the method of distribution and the breadth of distribution. Right. Uh, um, in other words, there are plenty of bands as good as the Rolling Stones, but they're not the ones that are national huge pop acts. Right. And the national huge pop acts that are are not are never going to be as good as the Rolling Stones or. But what do you mean? what do you mean as good? What do you mean as good? Oh, I mean it's good it's because good, like the, good, the Spice Girls aren't going to be as and Backstreet Boys aren't going to be as good the, the, because, because, they're, because the they're only fake. yeah. Yes, essentially, yes. So the only thing that you can sell at that uber mass level is is stuff that's completely generic and bubblegummy. Right. Um, so that makes, that makes really sense. But at the, but at, yeah, okay. But then if we if we say that Jay Z and Beyonce are the Rolling Stones of today, then it seems like you know they could be doing stuff. It's not. I'm not really a big hip hop fan, but I uh, I have one Jay -Z, uh, one uh, Kanye album that I really really like. My it's called. But it's not the most recent one that came out like three or four years ago. Uh, my beautiful dark twisted fantasy, I think it's called. It's a great album. I, if you haven't heard it, I really recommend it. So, um, and of course, it's interesting that, that you know there's this whole uh, a lot of uh, 
the great rock music uh, took things from the black blues, blues musicians and hip hop yeah, is, is the uh, kind of the last area that whites are colonizing black music. And so the biggest stars today are black musicians like Jay Z, Beyonce, and, and Kanye, yeah. who are you know performing their own music. And you know, there's artists like Macklemore and Eminem who yeah. are uh, you know using using this form. But uh, you could wonder whether the reason that Kanye West can't be the Rolling Stones is because Kanye West is black and the Rolling Stones weren't. I don't think that's it at all. I think, and actually, I don't think, I don't think that Kanye West and Beyonce are the Rolling St- are the equivalents. I'm saying that that's no longer possible. Mm-hmm. Queen, Queens of the Stone Age is the equivalent to to, to Rolling Stones now. Um, there is nothing that can be that big that can be as good as the Rolling Stones. Right. Now, okay. That, make, that makes saying. sense to me. That makes sense to me. Um, 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 and don't get me on the rap thing because, as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, the last good rap act was Wu Tang Clan, and I think Jay Z sucks. So I'm not going to get started on that. Okay, you. So you must know more about hip hop than I do because you... I'm old school. I listen to Public Enemy and and NWA. Okay, well, I I get I I, I, re- I recommend um, the, the Kanye album, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, because I think it's really good. But we got a little far afield from from yes, superheroes. So where do you uh, you know we probably can't do everything we we planned on. Where do you want to talk about now? Do you want to do listing top films? Do you want to talk about why, why the grittiness we, we could kind of talk we, about we could you know why don't we fit we could finish with our picks okay um why don't we drop as much as it pains me because it's my favorite why don't we drop the watchman which is a very specialized topic okay um and maybe it'll, it'll come up anyway because it's going to be in my list um why don't we talk a little bit about the gritty versus the romantic because i think um that 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 is an interesting uh a question an interesting change okay um, so why don't, why don't you introduce that so so here's what i had in mind it's sort of, it's sort of I really, really dislike the Nolan, uh, the Nolan Batman reboot. Okay. Um, I'm probably the only person who thought that Heath Ledger was god awful Joker. Oh no. Okay, um, we really disagree um, about that then. Um, um, and um, <clears throat> and so my spe- my specific reason is indicative of my more general reason. So my my specific reason is, it struck me that by the time you get to Dark Knight, it's dark for dark's sake. Mm-hmm. It's dark because now that's what's cool. We have to be really dark, and everything has to. What, the next thing has to be grimmer than the last. The other thing I'm thinking of is the Battlestar Galactica reboot. I watched the original when I was a kid, and I loved it. And mm-hmm. then the reboot comes, and it is so effing grim. I couldn't even make it through half half of the episodes <laughs> because it was so. It just depressed me and, and beyond belief. Yeah. Um, so this is the obvious thing. Like the way to you know the the critique that um, is that you know they take something that's made for kids. And then they just say, "Oh, we'll just make it really dark and gritty," and that—that's how we'll make it appeal to adults. That's kind of. And that's all. Not, I don't. I don't think it's just to appeal to adults. That's now what you. What's required to have cred with the older kids. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and um, because and if so, you put out the Adam West Batman today, it would. It would not. You know, yes, and, and and by the way, I'm not going to argue that we should be going back to that type of superhero movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but this now is is, in my opinion, grim for grim's sake. And in my opinion, winds up getting away from what comic books and superheroes were always about, are really about, um, and turns it into something that it's not really about, and that strikes me as less, less, a lot less fun. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Joker is supposed to be a Joker. He's not <laughs> supposed to be. He's not supposed to be Jeffrey Dahmer uh-huh. with a little makeup on his face. Okay. Um, um, he's supposed to be a Joker who, who's, who's whose crimes are these elaborate and, and, and interesting pranks. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Heath Ledger just turned him into Jeffrey Dahmer with some bad clown makeup on. And I find that, A, I just don't find it interesting. And uh-huh. B, I don't think it has anything to do with what people have been reading Batman for for five generations. For. Oh, okay. Um, so, so you prefer um, the Jack Nicholson Joker from yeah. so here's the Tim the thing. Burton Batman? I, Right, so the Tim Burton strike me as 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 hitting the as hitting the right balance. Yes, you cannot make the kind of naive, aw shucks, George Reeves Superman or 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 the campy, fun going Adam West Batman. We we do want things to be a little more realistic. We do want things to have a little more emotional impact. We do want, but what Tim Burton didn't do was he didn't go so far. In other words, it's still heavily stylized. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still got a lot of camp in it and humor. Um, and, um, and yes, and the the picture of the Joker strikes me as perfect, right? Pitched it right in the middle of where it needs to be Mm -hmm. and not this just sort of, you know, uh, uh, bloodthirsty, uh, uh, horror show 
which is what the Dark Knight uh, struck me as being. I found them joyless and uninteresting, and I didn't even make it through the third one. I thought it was so terrible. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'm will i going to mount a defense of yeah, no, please, uh, yeah. the second Batman movie in the Christian Nolan trilogy. So I agree the third one. I did not like the third Nolan Batman uh, at all. They really, uh, maybe, maybe I'm souring on Nolan overall, but having Bane be total, uh, making it very hard to understand what he was saying was a very poor creative choice. But right. I, I will defend, I think, um, The Dark Knight, which is the movie um, with Heath, Heath Ledger as the Joker, is one of my top five uh, comic book movies of all time. And I think it's just a, a really great movie. I think the Heath Ledger performance is great. And I think what. So I kind of have a different perspective on Batman and the Joker. So the classic comic book heroes have a classic villain who who is their opposite. So Superman's villain is Lex Luthor. So Superman is the, it has like every power possible. He can fly. He's invulnerable. X-ray vision, super fast, everything. And then so his exact opposite is Lex Luthor, who is really smart but just a regular human with no superpowers at all. So that's a great yin yang um, contrast. And similarly, uh, Batman. Uh, is the ultimate, uh, you know, he, they, his, he originally appeared in something called Detective Comics, as I'm sure you know. And right. so he kind of still keeps this kind of almost Sherlock Holmes-inspired detective aspect to him. And he's the ultimate logical um, character. And he can, you know, so, kind of solve everything and, and use his intelligence and create these kind of traps and stuff like that, in, in the classic understanding of the character, at least. Um, so he's the ultimate logical character. And then the Joker is the ultimate illogical character. You know, he does things for no reason at all, just for a laugh. And so they made it darker with Heath, Heath Ledger, but they made him, you know, the Heath Ledger character was basically uh, the ultimate nihilist. Uh, he believed in nothing. And I think there's a line in the movie that actually a lot of people quoted since then because it kind of describes both terrorism and the kind of mass shooting events that plague America, which is he's someone who just wants to see the world burn. And that's an actual type that exists out there of people who just want destruction for destruction's sake or because they're so psychologically yeah. damaged that they lash out in this awful way. And they, when they have a, a machine gun, they can kill a number of people. And, you know, the, with the, short, the shooting in Aurora, Colorado, um, there were some reports that the guy had made himself look like uh, the Joker character um, when, he, when he committed this atrocity. Um, so I think and, – and there's also a, a war on terror critique built into this movie – because uh, Batman, it's a little silly, but Batman creates this kind of like total information awareness thing where he like takes over all the cameras or something in Gotham so he can yeah. monitor what's happening at all times. So it, it kind of prefigures the Edward Snowden critique about <clears throat> the surveillance state. Yeah. And uh, so I think having the Joker be this ultimate nihilist who just is irrational and crazy and a psychopath, putting him up against Batman, the ultimate rationalist, I think that is a really good contrast. And I think it's a, a lot better movie than either of the original Burton movies. Well, look, I, it's the funny thing is I don't disagree with a lot of what you said. And, and I, I think that actually the Joker of, of the, of this, of the sort that I'm imagining and thinking about is a Nile is an ultimate nihilist. Mm -hmm. the, to me that which I find objectionable and, and sort of uh, 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 entertainment breaking is the tone of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I think that Jack Nicholson's Joker was any less of a nihilist than, than Heath Ledger's, mm -hmm. but the style and manner of it um, um, retained some of its comic book uh, campiness. Right. Because remember, at the end of the day, the whole thing is bloody ridiculous. It's people <laughs> dressed up in costumes and make grown people yeah. dressed up in costumes and makeup and running around um, um, uh, uh, in tights. And um, and so I I think that what what I object to with the 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 the, the reboot is that it abandoned a lot of the tone and the sort of tropes and the stylization that in my opinion gave comics their, their sort of their, the superhero comics, their distinctive sort of quality um, and, um, and undermines un undermine. I, I think a, a, a comic, let's put it this way. A comic book that has no humor is a mistake. Right. And the, the, the dark Knight movies are freaking humorless. The Joker's not funny. He's, he's, he's appalling. Yeah. Um, okay. That's, and, that's a good critique that the original conception of the Joker is that he does things that are funny in this sick way. Right. And, um, and uh, actually in the dark in, in Frank Miller's, the dark Knight, doesn't he release laughing gas yes. on, on Letterman's show? Isn't that what happens? Yes. Yes. That causes everyone to die with a rictus grin on their face. Right. Um, 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 you know, it, it, it just, it, 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 it abandoned what I thought 
it didn't have the flavor tone feel of a comic book movie. It didn't have any of the humor. It was just a grim action movie with maybe an interesting message where the people happened to be dressed up as, as superheroes. Mm-hmm. But I didn't actually feel like I was watching a superhero movie um, um, uh, because it, it lacked that bit, that bit of the absurd, right? right? That bit of the, um, uh, and I felt a little bit the same, you know, about the Battle Star Galactica reboot. I mean, at the end of the day, science fiction television shouldn't be that serious. Um, it can be serious, but not that serious. Mm-hmm. And, uh, this struck me as being uh, too serious. Um, I should say that I do think that there's an exception. I mean, there is, you know, maybe we'll do another one of these, um, but because there's so much to talk about, but there is another type of superhero movie where I think the grimness works a lot better, and that's on the more indie side. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm thinking of movies like Super, um, the first, the first Kick-Ass, um, where it's pretty intense stuff and the violence is over the top and very intense. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the endings are sad, not happy. I mean, there's not justice or resolution in the end. Right. But these, Um, these, but the ones you're you're describing, I I saw kick ass and read the comic, but I did not see super. I don't think that is that the one with um, Dwight Schrute in it. It's the the one that has Liv Tyler as his girlfriend and Kevin Bacon plays the gangster. Okay, so and, both, of the, uh, both these movies are basically set in the real world, and people who are inspired right. by comic books decide, decide right. to become right. heroes themselves. And actually, it's something that weirdly has happened somewhat in reality, although some, in yes. a bizarre way. There's some article I read that was in GQ or something from the past year or so. Anyway, both of these, I mean, but these are like postmodern works. Right, and so what I was saying was I think the grimness works because there what's being explored is the sort of the vigilantism side of, of it. And the sort of the, in other words, it seems to me that superheroes have two sorts of, there's two sorts of interesting things about them. One of them is, is a kind of, uh, of, of fantasizing, uh, escapism, but also kind of, um, um, uh, uh, the creation of sort of idol archetypes, mm-hmm. um, um, which all speak to oh, idol, spe- I D O L. Yes, idea. idol idol archetypes, right. which which all speak to sort of the as the aspiring dimension, or the aspiring dimension of our psyche. Yeah. Um, but I also think that there's a side of superheroes that's interesting. Is like when you ask this question, well, what sort of person would actually want to do this, right? A, a and crazy of person. Course, <laughs> what, what it comes down to is you know vigilantes, and we do listen. Bernard Getz, uh, who killed all who killed these people on the subway, um, um, you know, could right. have easily been. One of the characters in Kick Ass or in Super, yeah, right? Uh, well, have um, you have you read the Chuck Klosterman from a book? I wear the black hat. Yes. yes okay. Yes, so okay. So, that's what, so he has yeah. a, he has an essay in there comparing the Batman character to right. Bernard Getz. Um, right. We'll, we'll so, go into the whole thing there, but it's an interesting book about villains. So ch- check it out. Right. So that's why. So so the, the the grimness works there because what it's the whole thing that it's speaking to is the grim side of human nature and, and to sort of the vigilante justice side of human nature, the revenge side of human nature. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but I don't think that's what classic mainline comics are about. The cl- classic mainline golden and silver age comics are about the other thing that I ta- mentioned, right? It starts out as, as, anti, as propaganda for the allies, right? Yeah. Um, um, against really who were evil enemies. I right. mean, you so have to make Hitler. punching Hitler in the face. That That's right. Thing. That's right. And and then later it got even more fantastical, oh. more crazy. But but it all speaks to our, our, our ideals. Yeah. And so when you make franchises like of Batman or Superman or the Avengers or whatever, if it totally abandons all of that, it loses a lot of what I think was its original raison was its raison d'etre to begin with. Right. Um. Um. I think Iron Man struck a really great balance with this because Robert Downey Jr. is so damn funny. Right. And so and so and so the movie is serious and it's hardcore and it's high tech and it's big blockbuster, but there are the jokes. Right. Yeah. And Dark Knight had none of that. It was freaking humorless, and I just found it almost unbearable. To- so I think one interesting uh, transition point we can talk about here is um, the Captain America movie. Did you see that one? Yes. The first yes. one? Okay, so that uh, is really interesting in that it kind of has both sides of this and plays it for laughs, which is it, you know, t- the Captain America character came, you know, invented before World War II started and was kind of a propaganda character. Um, but it also, in the movie, they, they started in the 40s, and after uh, Steve Rogers becomes Captain America, he's basically sent on a propaganda tour. That's right. And they, they have him, they put him in this ridiculous outfit that looks like the original 
Captain America outfit, That's like right. knitted, knitted out of wool or something. Yeah. And they even recreate the famous cover that we talked about of him punching Hitler in basically kind of like a variety act. That's right. So basically they reduced Captain America to a, a USO That's right. tour kind of, kind of figure. That's right. So this is in the movie, and it's really clever when you think about uh, this this dichotomy between the classic comics that are just kind of fun and the, and the dark, gritty stuff. So then eventually in the, in the movie, Captain America becomes sick of – being just a propaganda character touring on USO shows and says he really wants to fight. And then kind of the rest of the plot of the movie goes on and he gets a better, a more realistic looking costume that is uh, in darker colors, literally. Yeah. Uh, not the, sh- the shiny red, white, and blue. Yeah. And uh, it's something that a soldier might conceivably possibly wear. And then the movie continues on in that way. So I think that's, I think Marvel has been smarter about this than DC in these movies including more humor to begin with and more kind of meta commentary um, about acknowledging the fact that these were things that were written for children originally. Yes. And um, yeah, I think, I think Marvel has done a better job than DC. And we're, and we're, in terms of movies. and we're originally, you know, we're, we're meant as to be aspirational and ide- and, and, and idealizations and to be um, um, uh, 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 op- optimistic and even idealistic. Um, and um, uh, and I think I, I really do think that there is something to this sort of these the, these two sides of what's interesting about superheroes. One is that side, and that's that characterizes most of the traditional superhero comics that both the Golden Age and the Silver Age. Um, and this other side, which is ex- so so, just to explain, the Golden Age of comics is from when Action Comics uh, one, which I think was 1939, which is right. the first appearance of Superman up until the early 60s. That's referred to popularly as the Golden Age right. of comics. The Silver Age starts with um, Stan Lee creating all the classic Marvel characters. I think Fantastic Four 1 is what people acknowledge as the beginning of the Silver Age. Yes. And these characters, as we said before, were more psychologically realistic in that uh, the Fantastic Four, which is the first one of these series, was a family, basically. Yes. And they got they got into arguments with each other in the way that families would, yes. but they all had superpowers. Yes. Spider-Man, the, the kind of the, the you know, teenager who gets beat up in his normal life. Um, but is uh, a su- superhero at night. So uh, that's the Silver Age, and then the Silver Age kind of ends sometime in the 70s or 80s, and really Watchmen and uh, Frank Miller's Dark Knight kind of are the next stage that's right. of the, gr- the, gritty, uh, the gritty superhero, that's right. which took over for a number of years. And I, I, think we're, I guess we're in a, a new stage now, which is, um, I don't know what you would call it, but it's kind of the postmodern, or uh, although Watchmen is obviously postmodern, the kind of tail-wagging the dog uh, era, which is... The um, the fact that alluded to in my conversation with Kristen Caps, um, you know they're canceling Fantastic Four because Marvel doesn't own the movie rights to yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so it's like no use to them anymore. That's, that's <laughs> so I don't know. That, that's why it's like that, it's like post postmodern. That's something. why the movie that 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 franchise never got a good movie treatment. I mean, there's you know it's it's been one terrible disaster after another. Um, um, yeah, and I and I, I I think that I think that the Golden and Silver Age. Um, captured one half of what's interesting about superheroes um and then and then and then and then the postmodern captures the other thing that's interesting i gotta tell you i don't think the dark gritty gritty period captures captures much of anything and the 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 reason i like the frank miller dark knight so much is that it's on the cusp it's it's in a sense a gateway. It's it's the end of something and the beginning of something. But but the postmodern ones are the gritty ones. Well, no, nah, I, I don't. It, it depends on what you mean by gritty and in what sense. I mean, look, um, I think Super is. Po- I'm when I'm speaking about postmodern, I'm talking about comics like like Super and uh, movies like Super and the first Kick Ass, in which. Um, it's really right, so. We, but we got to split the the postmodern yeah. movies from the postmodern comics because Watchmen, which was 1986 or so, I think the comic book was the postmodern yes. th- comic. Yes, you have to you have to admit that. Yes, but the movie which came out in 2010 or so, I don't know what what you would characterize it postmodern or not. It hewed to the comic closely, which I think was one of its failings. Right. And we can talk about it more generally, but. It, you can't not you can't say that that Watchmen is not no, no, postmodern. No, but actually, I would I would group. Watchmen. I would say Watchmen is the precursor of, of actually of things like Super and Kick Ass, not mm-hmm. Dark Knight. Um, okay, that's um, interesting because you have Ror- Rorschach is the vigilante character. Not just because so of probably... right. and, and also Night Owl. The, 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 the whole thing is a meditation on the sort of what if these were real people, 
um, right. um, you know, the, the, the comedian. I mean, these are all vigilantes, right? Um, as yeah. a matter of fact, the government has to outlaw them. That's the Keen Act, right? Um, yeah. Um, um, so, so for anyone who – okay, so, so Watchmen, for people who don't read comics, Watchmen is maybe the greatest comic ever written. Certainly a lot of people would say it is. I, it's my f- favorite comic ever. But um, you, it's a postmodern deconstruction of comics in that. And so in the, in the previous dialogue with Christian Caps, I talked about, you know, what comic would you recommend for someone who's never read comic before, comics before to say, here's a great introduction. I think you mentioned Watchmen. And I said, but you, you have to know comics. No, I said Dark Knight. I, I said Dark Knight, actually. I said the French. Oh, okay. So, yeah. yeah. So Watchmen, it's like, it's like saying, so the, the, the equivalent would be for someone who's never read a book before handing them Ulysses. And saying, "Oh, this is the best book. Right. You know, check out check out this one. You'll you'll love right. books." Um, so, <laughs> so Watchmen is the Ulysses of comic books, and you have to kind of know comic books yeah. before you can get yeah. Watchmen. But Watchmen is amazing, and uh, I'm sh- but the thing is, that you can't really recommend it because everyone who loves comics probably has read Watchmen. But if you if you do read comics or read comics as a kid, you should and haven't read yeah. Watchmen, uh, definitely recommend it because it's great. And the reason I th- you know, I think of I think of Watchmen and Dark Knight both as gateways to the next phase. Because um, while Watchmen was postmodern in its content, it had a lot of the tropes and the style of the traditional comics. Um, um, and so they looked like old fashioned superheroes, but their right. personality, they were actually real people underneath that. And I thought that was done incredibly effectively. And so I do think that, that Watchmen is the gateway that leads us to the what I've been calling postmodern, the super and the mm-hmm. kick-ass and this sort of stuff, which addresses that second aspect of superheroes that I think are interesting, which is almost, you might call them psychoanalytical, let's call them that, right? Um, okay. The Dark Knight, the Miller Dark Knight, is a gateway to what you're also calling postmodern, but what I'm calling the dark for dark's sake. And mm-hmm. while I think the Frank Miller one is really good because it's a gateway, I don't think that, I think that that didn't go anywhere. It sort of exhausted itself it's, yeah, in, I agree. in a race to the bottom of grimness, and yeah. um, so so a lot of so as we kind of alluded to before, before before the Frank Miller Dark Knight, Batman was kind of a joke character, and Adam West, you know the Bam, yeah, know, Bam Pow, Bam Pow stuff was <laughs> was you know the image of Batman, and he changed the character in a way that led to the movies that the, how Batman is popular right. today, but um, yeah, I guess but. but yeah, so there's postmodern. I mean, I, you know, postmodern is a, is a term that it's hard to define. But you know, since Watchmen is a comic that's about comics, and um, yeah, that's what makes it so yeah. brilliant. And that's also why I think it failed as a movie. But why don't we actually t- sure. move on to talking about our favorite our movies, picks, because, our favorite yeah. comic book movies? <laughs> and you listed Watchmen as one of your favorite comic movies, yeah. which really surprised me because I was very disappointed in it. So who wants? To, um, you, so who's going first? You or me? You, why don't you go first? Uh, I feel like I've been talking too much. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so I'll, I'll give you. I'll, I'll count down my top five from number five, and I'll just give a little blurb on each one. I'm not going to go on for a long time. Um, so uh, no, my number in the number, of, and I actually was originally a top ten. Please understand that this really should be a top ten, and that there are things that should. <laughs> uh, we can you can post the full right, top ten in the comments below sh- this. There's very, my point just is uh, no, all joking aside. There are very good movies that are not on my list. Right, so the first, uh, the it, first, not, not definitive. Right, the first Iron Man's amazing. The first Captain America is amazing. They're not on the list. All right, so okay. so number five is the original Tim Burton Batman, um, and uh, for for many of the reasons I said, it's the first one where they made a serious go at making a real big blockbuster movie uh, uh, out of out of superhero comics. Um, it's mm-hmm. got the style. It's got the it's got the vibe. It's got the it's got the mood. Um, it's got a lot of flaws. It's it's long in the in the second half. Um, mm-hmm. But so I haven't actually seen that since I was a kid. Is it it, it holds up? It, is what you're saying? It holds up, but you'll notice the flaws. Um, mm-hmm. And actually, Tim Burton. I, I read some interview with him recently where he was laughing um, after the Nolan reboot came out. He's like, "Yeah, people used to tell me that mine was too dark." Right, um, um, and now and today we remember that one as being whimsical. Right, so if you watch the, if you, if you if you're bred, born and bred on the on the Nolan reboot, the the I'm not sure that the Tim Burton is going to seem to you like the Adam West seemed to people who were bred who were who, who, who the Tim Burton were the, the yeah. Tim Burton generation. But anyway, yeah. So, oh, but I just want to briefly say, um, I know you haven't seen the movie Birdman, but um, the movie Birdman, of course, stars Michael Keaton and is a kind of direct reaction to the Batman movies and superhero movies in general. I think it's a really good movie 
it has a chance of winning the Best Picture Oscar, which would definitely be a funny way for comic book movies to be legitimized. Uh, this kind of, and it's definitely a postmodern movie, but I, I recommend everyone see see Birdman, whether or not they like comics, because it's just kind of a, a really good movie. And that's it's on my list since you recommended it very highly. Um, mm-hmm. Number four is a movie that uh, some people, I mean, it's it's the second film by M Night Shyamalan um, called Unbreakable. Oh, okay, yeah, um, that's interesting. And it, it was it's one of the more unusual superhero movies. It's not an overtly superhero movie. There's no costume. There's no, but it is a superhero movie. And more interestingly, it's an origin story um, mm-hmm. um, that um, basically describes the rise of. Uh, a superhero uh, from an everyman. Um, yeah. um, and his power is that he's unbreakable. He cannot be killed. He cannot be injured. He does not get old. He does not get sick. Now, I right. don't want to spoil the movie because like the great M. Shyamalan uh, movies, um, of which this is one, uh, he became tired and, and, and his shtick got old. But this was yeah. still when it was fresh and it still is really outstanding. I don't want to give mm-hmm. away a lot of spoilers. But it's not only an origin movie of the superhero, it's an origin movie of the villain. Of the villain. Of the right, and, right. and it's done so well, and the acting is so incredibly good, and it is so realistic. If if a movie ever was able to convey how if something that fantastical really happened, what it would be like, this mm-hmm. does it. Uh, and so that mm-hmm. that's the reason why like, it's also beautiful looking. It's beautifully shot. It's um, you know, it, it reminds me that uh, that I think that movie is somehow thematically closer to what Alan Moore was trying to do in Watchmen than the Watchmen movie was. Maybe, maybe uh, when you think about how. Um, thinking about how if if there was in real life a someone with superpowers, like what would actually happen? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so uh, number three um, is uh, is the first Kick Ass. Uh, I love the second one too, but the first one is just absolutely uh, brilliant. Um, it does represent, in my opinion, the pinnacle of what I've been calling the postmodern psychoanalytical type of. Uh, type of uh, superhero movie. Um, maybe mm-hmm. Super does it even a little bit better, but but it's not as complete a package as, 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 as Kick-Ass is. Um, uh, Kick-Ass is basically uh, about, you know, kids, a kid who becomes a superhero. Basically, he and his friends are comic book fans. And they say, yeah. like, well, why doesn't anybody actually become a superhero? And so he goes and does. And, of yeah. course, you then find out why people don't because you get the <laughs> crap beaten out of you and you get killed and knifed and shot and blown up and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah. It's also an incredibly subversive movie. The movie was, in a sense, stolen by Chloe Moretz, um, who plays the plays Hit Girl, who is a 10-year-old, right. 10-year-old superhero assassin um, and a foul and foul mouth. And it really um, broke a lot of barriers in terms of, I think, female roles. Uh, and mm-hmm. especially the sort of the the infantilization uh, of children that we that we mm-hmm. that we do in a kind of a sick and weird way that could be a whole subject of a whole nother buying heads. So I, I think that the whole thing just works incredibly well. Um, the number my number two uh, is the Avengers, um, which I think more than any of the big blockbuster films got it exactly right in terms of mm-hmm. the balance of seriousness, big set pieces but also humor and camp. It really yeah. did it all. It did. It nailed every single element. It was also the first one that got the Hulk right, where you didn't just want to burst out laughing looking at it. Um, they, they, they managed to do that in a way. Ruffalo's performance is just incredible. Um, um, right, and one thing that's interesting is He's that, probably the best um, one in it, I think. Uh, I mean, is that um, the Hulk is kind of the one character from this classic lineup of the Avengers who they haven't able, been able to successfully make into his own movie. That's right. There were two Hulk movies. The first one was Ang Lee and who played the Hulk? I can't remember his was name, it? that Australian actor. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it was... And then the second one was Ed Norton. And that was kind of a flop, too. And these both came kind of before Marvel started up this whole Avengers world. But there's been three Hulks on the silver screen in the past 15 years. And he hasn't starred in his own movie that's been a smash success in the way that all the other Marvel characters were. And, of course, he had his own TV show with Lou Ferrigno in in the 70s. So it's kind of, you know, why can't... I mean, the Hulk is, is a kind of a very strange character. It's a hard thing um, to do because, you know, to really do him correctly, you have to use CGI. But then right. that, of course, then makes the whole character uncompelling. And what they have did with with Ruffalo's performance and getting it to come through 
um, was really uh, was really remarkable. I thought, um, and so mm-hmm. I have Avengers as number two, and I do indeed have Watchmen as number one. And I, I, I have to tell you, I honestly don't understand the dislike for the movie. Um, first of all. I think it was incredibly faithful to the comic. Uh, in, okay, that's the problem. But I don't. See, I mean, that's that's my problem. But why? So why, why do you say that, why you think you liked why it? Why is why? Well, why don't you tell me why it's a problem that it's faithful to the comic? Okay, because Watchmen is such a comic as a comic. Like, there's so many things in it that refer to the uh, history of comics, the what a comic means. There's a comic within the comic that someone is reading. Yes. And since in in a world where. Um, where superheroes really exist, there wouldn't be a need for superhero comics. So in the comic within a comic is a pirate story. Right, but have you watched so, the extended cut of Watchmen? Because it has all that in it. Oh, yeah. Well, I saw the, the animated thing they added on on the DVD. But um, but I have to say, it's just like, I mean, to compare it to Ulysses again, which is kind of absurd because Ulysses is the greatest novel ever written, um, uh, it's be like making a movie out of Ulysses. It wouldn't work. Um, yeah. They, they, they were so faithful to it, and even though they did change some things with the plot, which pitched off some of the fanboys, that wasn't my problem with it. It was just that it just didn't work as a movie. It was such a comic as a comic that it didn't work, in the, it didn't translate across genres. It's, it'd be like trying to make a, a good movie out of Catcher in the Rye. It just wouldn't work. So, like, a, great novels are novels. And what's interesting is that a lot of the... Um, when they try to make a movie out of a great novel, it usually isn't a very good movie. But then the great movies are made out of shitty novels. Well, that's true. So the God, the Godfather is infamously right. a really right. crappy novel right. that was made into a great right. movie, and there's a number of a number of examples of this. Yeah. That, yeah. Steve, you know, Steve, so, Stephen King's entire career, right? I mean, I mean, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, he's the fam- He's famous for, um, you know, some of the best directors uh, uh, making much better versions of his books than his books. Um, but but right, and you can you know you can never actually I was I was. Um, Listening to, um, I'm way behind on my Slate Culture Gap Fest. I don't know if you have, if you listen to that, um, but so they did a live show and someone asked them, asked Dana Stevens, the the movie critic for Slate, um, if you could pick any uh, director and star to um, uh, make a Moby Dick movie, who would you pick? And she basically said, it would never work. You you couldn't make a Moby Dick movie. Yeah. It would be a failure because yeah. Moby Dick is a book about novels in some ways, and it doesn't, right. you know, the, there's all the chapters about uh, the history of whaling and the biology of yeah. whales, so you you couldn't make a, a Moby Dick movie, you would have to cut all that stuff because it would never work, it didn't make any sense to have a, uh, you know, inter, intercut with a lesson on yeah. uh, cytology or whatever, but, um, you know, it just, it just wouldn't work. So, 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 so some things are just stuck in the genre that they are, and... Um, I think Watchmen is, is is like that. It's the Moby Dick, okay, so, <laughs> the Moby so, Dick of graphic novels. So, so let me let me make my two minute defense of it, and then you can give your list. Um, okay. Um, because I do have it as number one, and so I should be able to defend it. Um, look, it doesn't do everything that the comic does, and I agree with you that at, at the extent to which the comic is a meta comic, it doesn't do that. Um, however. It does very well what I was talking about as that second thing that's interesting about superheroes, and that's the psychoanalytic postmodern sort of vision um, mm-hmm. in terms of looking into the sort of psyche of people who, are, who, who have a vigilante mentality and would actually, actually go so far as to act on it. Um, mm-hmm. I thought it did that extremely well. Um, in that, in that it really, especially, I think the characters of, I think the character of Night Owl was very well fleshed out with all of his mm-hmm. internal sort of insecurities and inadequacies and conflicts. Um, um, and the way in which, in a sense, the superhero identity almost turned him into something better than the, the geek that he really was. Um, uh, and, 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 and it's done very well with the Rorschach character. So I think it did that very well. I also think it did very well the intergenerational. The, the first generation of the heroes and then the mm-hmm. second generation mm-hmm. of the heroes. Well, I'll tell you the thing that I really like the most well. about the movie is the opening credit sequence. It's one of the best openings that has ever been in a film. Uh, yeah, so when I went to see um, Watchmen and I saw this open credits, I was... I was blown away. It's probably on YouTube. We can probably link to it if people haven't seen the movie because it's only five <laughs> or so minutes. It's a, it's a recounting of the alternate history of this right. world um, in which superheroes really do exist. That's right. And it's, it's a montage of slow motion <laughs> uh, takes... And set to the times they are changing, right. and it just works really, really well. And of course, that's something that wasn't in the comic. In right. the comic, you kind of have to piece together the history right. of this alternate reality yourself. So they took something that was in the comic, uh, made it really great, but then I think slavishly trying to uh, <clears throat> stick to the things that happened in the comic was the reason that the movie didn't work as a movie. The last thing that I thought it did really well um, was I thought it really did really good job 
of not just depicting the political dimension of Watchmen, the critique of Watchmen, but also exposing underneath the, 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 the very sort of right, very right wing way of thinking that underlies a lot of the vigilantism. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that that was one of the main elements of Watchmen. It's also a main element right. in the original Dark Knight, although in Dark Knight, Frank Miller himself is actually kind of right wing in his views on these sorts of things. And so there, yeah. there it's actually meant in a positive way, not as a critique. But in yeah. Watchmen, it's meant as a critique. So I think the only right. thing that the we, we I think we can have a whole dialogue that's just about the politics, yeah, the, of oh, comics yeah. and the figure of the superhero and the vigilante, and we're already <laughs> almost an hour yes, and a half in. Yes. So we should probably we should probably wrap it up. Yeah. But I'll just give I'll just your, quickly give, say, give me your top five and we'll, 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 okay. So actually, while oh, I, it's changed while we've had this conversation, originally my I, so I swapped in Captain America as my number five, thinking about it more and that very clever kind of postmodern take on the origin of Captain America and, and all that stuff. So I put him at, I put that at five. Um, Iron Man two would be number four. Uh, Avengers at three. Um, uh, Dark Knight uh, at two. And then Spider-Man two. Uh, so this is the uh, first iteration of Spider-Man with Tobey Maguire. Yes. Spider-Man two would be my favorite. Spider-Man two is just a great movie, Amazing. comic fan or not. And so I, I, as you see, there's a theme here. In, in my um, in my nominations, that three of my top five are actually the second movie in in the in the series. Yeah. A lot of these are, tri are trilogies, and some of them they seem like they're going to keep rebooting them ad infinitum. And actually, I was thinking it's kind of funny because you know it seems absurd to, that they rebooted Spider-Man when they made the first movie ten years earlier. But then I, I thought about how in comic books time doesn't really exist yeah. in the normal way because Peter Parker always stays like he's around twenty five or so. So this is really just a way to recapture what happens in the comics. I guess so. Is that they just they just reboot it, and then you have another Peter Parker who's back in high school. Right, right, right. And so and because you can't – Tobey Maguire is in his 40s now, right, I assume. I guess, he can't be right, Spider-Man right, anymore. Right, right. So, the, it, 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 yeah, there's this weird thing in comics where you know Captain America is really the only one who were, is established as existing in some specific time period because he fought in World War II. But the other ones, all the other characters exist in this strange kind of yeah, time loop where – They don't age. Uh, you know, the, the, yeah, they, they never age because it wouldn't make a lot of sense to have these elderly people as superheroes. Anyway, so that's my uh, – so I have um, – I think that usually the, the second movie in these series is better – because telling the origin story is often kind of clunky, and it, it's like you have to show them before they were a hero. Yeah. And usually they – a lot of the – of course, in these – because they're archetypes, something they do when they're not a hero influences what happens, how they become a hero. So Peter Parker becomes Spider-Man because he didn't stop the criminal who killed his Uncle Ben. So he learns that with great power comes great responsibility. Right. So, I mean, that's a classic lesson, and that's great stuff. But And, you know, Tony Stark, you have to show that he was kind of a lush and a playboy before he became Iron Man had to become serious. So all these things you have to build up this origin story, and it takes a long time, and it's usually kind of clunky because, you know, in these original series that, you know uh, – that uh, Stan, when Stan Lee wrote the first Spider-Man, he told that whole origin story in 24 pages. You know, he didn't need two and a half hour That's movie right. to do it. Um, so, so usually once you have the character established, it's the second movie that I think is usually the, the best one. You you got rid of the, the origin story's over, everyone knows who it is, and then you can just tell a really great, or great story. So that's why I think uh, my pet theory about why the second movies. In these in this genre is, are usually best. Right. So we've we've gone really super long. That's okay. Um, why don't Why don't we wrap up there? If, if anyone if anyone is still listening, who possibly um, uh, maybe we have some hardcore comic book fans who are still listening, but maybe there's still someone who's listening to this who isn't a comic book fan. And I talked about this with Kristen Caps before. Uh, but I, uh, what would you recommend for? I mean, everyone has seen these movies now, or at least heard of them. But if if they're looking for to actually read a comic or a graphic novel, what would you recommend they pick up if they've never done so before? You know, now what's nice is that you, a lot of the classic Golden Age and Silver Age comics you can buy in volumes, uh, book right. forms. And so I would go pick one of the original franchises. I would pick the original X-Men or I would pick the original Fantastic Four or the original Avengers. I would get mm -hmm. one of those omnibus books that has, you know, the first 10 years or 20 years of it. And I would start from the beginning. Uh, and a lot of those series, uh, the, the beginnings, I think, are some of the best. I love the, I like the early X-Men better than, than the later X-Men. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same with the Avengers. Um, um, so I would just pick up any of these franchises and start from the beginning. Uh, uh, and that's easy to do now because of these uh, published omnibuses that you can buy. 
Right. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. And I, even though I was a comic book fan, I never re- I read some of the early ones. They would usually they would often republish like X Men One or Amazing Fantasy Fifteen, the first appearance of Spider Man. So I reread those, but I never reread the whole runs. And I think something that I've always wanted to say, uh, have noted publicly, is like what an amazing person Stan Lee was. Oh or God, still is, yeah. he's still alive. Like I mean, he's in a way you can compare him to like Shakespeare. He created these characters. That, you know, he did them all. He created all, except for Captain America, uh, he created all of these classic characters, the Marvel characters um, who we've been talking about and are now multi-billion dollar industries. Yeah. And he did them all simultaneously, like in the in a span of like five years in the early 60s. And these characters are iconic and are going to live forever. And they all, they're all from the mind of this, of this one guy who kind of has become this mascot or kind of like silly figure. He was even parody in a, a sketch on key and peel i don't know if you saw that this season they did a, a sketch about about stan lee about how he's kind of pathetic now and still like pitching all these ideas but uh um, no, I mean, I the guy's just a creative genius i mean he, i think he really is almost yeah. the, he's not shakespeare because the writing was never that good but in terms of the ideas like he, he created these archetypes or, or, or took archetypes that existed and, and made them modern in a way that that's really incredible he, what he's created as part of americana as, as much americana as anything else and um, I think of, if you think about how many generations of kids consciousness he's a part of, he was a part of, um, you can start to get a sense of the influence. I think the influence is enormous um, and can only be understated, not overstated. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's pretty incredible when you think about it. And just I'm, I'm sure he has not been paid commensurate with all the money that has been made off of his creations. So that, that's a that's a story for another yeah. time. But the one thing I will recommend thinking about it more since my original conversation with Chris Turner talked about comic books is um did you ever read any of the um uh oh gosh it's falling, coming out of my it's, I'm forgetting what it's called. Was it called Marvel Unlimited? No, it was um so they did these these reboots of some of the Marvel characters around the year two thousand, starting entire in a different universe, starting over entirely. Yeah, I skipped that. I skipped all, that. All, all, ultimate. Yeah, yeah, called, ultimate. yeah. So ultimate. So what I would recommend for someone who has never read comics before <coughs> is pick up the first trade paperback of Ultimate Spider Man. So I mentioned before that Stanley told the Spider Man origin story over the course of a single issue, you know, twenty four pages or so. So it, this is written by Brian Michael Bendis, who's one of the best uh, creators of this generation, comic book writers. And so he took the the origin story, that first issue, and he spreads it, spreads it over 12 issues. And so you actually do get some stuff about Peter Parker before he becomes Spider-Man, extensively just a nerd. And it really humanizes the character and is just really great. So he uses the template that Stanley uses, that Stanley created, but um, comes back it, with a, a much better uh, – the dialogue is, is really what Bendis is great at. So uh, if, you're, if you're interested, if you've seen the Spider-Man movies uh, and liked them, uh, the – Ultimate Spider-Man is much better, and we'll include a link down below. So I think we've tired the patience of even our most committed blogging hits fans with this long conversation about comic books. But it's been really interesting, and hopefully, uh, Dan, you'll come back on again, because obviously there's still a lot of stuff that we could have talked about that we didn't. I enjoyed it very much, and don't worry about the time. This is not a captive audience. People can stop and watch more later. It's not not, not like forcing people to sit through a three-hour movie. <laughs> That's true. And, and since I sat through Interstellar this past weekend, which is almost three hours, I, I would not want to subject that. To, I would not want to subject anyone uh, to that. Okay, so uh, thanks so much, Dan. We'll have you on again, and uh, thanks to all of our viewers, and we'll see you again soon. Take care, Arya. Thanks. Bye. Stopping now.